I knew the country pretty good. They had the land, I used to go out, and uh, the wind would be blown, I could take them, and the snow was down, and you'd be frozen with a rock, and you'd turn back 50 feet, you couldn't see where your snow your tail was. Because at one point, you see, the road out to, to Weimar didn't exist in those days. There was no road from Nelson to Weimar. Yeah, right. So a lot of people who went into the mines went this way. They could go, they could go into Weimar or they could go into, into, into the other way and down into Tide. That's the Indians. And they got their kind of winter supply of fish, I guess. That's what they, or the whole lane, that's what they came down for. They used to fish for lane, and right by the, by the lighthouse up there, there's kind of a little flat. Mm -hmm. And a bay, and they had quite a camp in there, mm -hmm. the Indians. And they would smoke their fish right there. Mm -hmm. I think fishing was, was their main stay around here. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> You ever want a thrill trying to get an end to an Indian canoe? <laughs> shaping the west arm landscape we see today. This area was probably glaciated several times in the past, with the most recent glacial advance occurring some 10,000 years ago. During this time, an enormous ice sheet covered the entire region, reaching an elevation of about 7,500 feet. Beneath the crushing weight of ice and snow, the west arm mountains were smooth and rounded. Only those highest peaks that jutted out above the snow line escaped the glacier's force and retained a rugged appearance. As the glaciers advanced, valleys were carved and over deepened. Later, when the climate warmed and the ice began to melt and retreat, Kootenai Lake began to take shape. As the ice continued to melt, the lake level lowered gradually from 2,300 feet to its present level of 1,738 feet. Evidence of these changing lake levels can be seen in the terraces of beach deposits that are found along the hillsides. As the glaciers retreated, the ancestors of the present-day Kootenai Indians came into the Kootenai River Basin from the south. They lived a unique lifestyle as generalists, exploiting the richness of the landscape around them. They fished for lingcod and salmon, hunted for ducks, geese, deer, caribou, and bear, and gathered numerous wild berries and plants from the hills around the lake. They were a water people, plying the lakes and rivers in their distinctive sturgeon nose canoes and traveling seasonally to favored campsites. The Lakes Indians, members of the interior Salish, arrived in the Kootenai region at a later date. They were salmon specialists, interested in exploiting the bountiful fish runs of the Columbia. The West Arm area was a kind of territorial boundary for both groups. The Kootenai traveled from their winter camps near present-day Creston to summer camps along beaches of the West Arm for fishing, hunting, and berry picking. The Lakes Indians also made seasonal sojourns into the West Arm area. Archaeological sites discovered in the West Arm confirmed that both groups moved through the region and made use of its resources. Remains of pit houses, which were interior Salish dwellings, have been found by Bonington Falls. 
Pictographs of both Kootenai and interior Salish origin have been found along the south side of the arm and just beyond the outlet area on the main lake. Numerous arrowheads, tools, and fish weights have been found dotting the shores. Three birch bark Indian canoes, large enough to contain three men and provisions for a week in each, but sufficiently light as to be carried by one man. I embarked in one with two Indians, Charles Teat, and two Indians in another, and a third contained Chief Grand Quate with the same complement of his tribe as in mine. The date was 1826, and it was to be the first recorded journey down the west arm of Kootenai Lake to the Columbia River. The Hudson's Bay Company employee, William Kitson, was greeted kindly by the Kootenai Indians, who agreed to guide him down the treacherous rapids and portages below the west arm. David Thompson, the Northwest Company explorer, had entered the Kootenai Lake area at the earlier date of 1808. However, because of rough water and the Kootenai's refusal to guide him, he did not penetrate the west arm area. John Palliser and other later explorers were not encouraged by the trading prospects and deemed the route impractical for transportation. It was the mineral prospects around Kootenai Lake that first focused attention on the area. Prospectors moving in from gold fields to the south were the pioneers and adventurers in this new land. With no stores or supply centers, they were forced to carry all that they needed on their backs. Often they relied on those with money to grub stake them with the supplies they needed for the season in exchange for an interest, usually half, of all their fines. Excitement around Ainsworth, Riendell, and Nelson Silver King drew miners and developers to the area. Although the south side of the West Arm remained peripheral to major mining activity, deposits of gold, silver, lead, and zinc were discovered and worked at a number of locations. Though placer mining was never a mainstay of the West Arm economy, numerous creeks were worked for placer gold. Stories were told of Indians bringing down gold from the hills, and old-timers recall at least one Chinese placer operation up Mill Creek, which proved lucrative. To better locate gold particles, which became trapped in stream eddies, placer miners would remove large numbers of boulders from the stream bed. Rows of river-smooth rocks near the base of Laska Creek, where the stream once divided into several channels, may have been a result of early placer activity. Prospectors and miners who turned their attention to hard rock deposits on the south side often realized that their finds were not rich enough to cover access and transportation costs. The thing is, the hummingbird mine is a camp up there, you know. I don't want to still stand it. There was a camp. Oh, yes, you could stay there much for a restate overnight, yes. You didn't have to be slept outside, too. But uh, I don't know, the hummingbird during the Depression years. Uh, there's a shaft, and uh, they had a little compressor up there, and that was a little mining camp, but uh, it didn't prove uh, you couldn't make any. There, there was not enough work. The grade was there, but the quantity wasn't there, so it was given up. Horses were used to pack equipment and supplies up the steep trails to the mine and carry ore back down. During the winter months, Raw hides of ore could be dragged by horses or mules down the hillside over smooth snow trails. Only a few of the mines that were worked on the south side ever recorded any production, but the scattered remains of mining activity can be observed throughout the region. A limestone quarry, which appeared on Dr. Brock's 1900 map, is located beside the CPR track about two miles east of Proctor. Quarrying was carried out underground in tunnels. It was then shipped by rail to a trail fertilizer plant in the 1930s and to the Marble X Company of Edmonton in the 1960s. Granite exposures along the Proctor branch of the CPR and Great Northern Rail Lines were quarried for railway culverts and bridges and used as building stone in Nelson. Mineral exploration on the south side of the arm has continued in recent years, but no production has occurred since about 1960. In 1889, George Owen Buchanan established the first sawmill on Kootenai Lake at the site of present-day Harrop. 
the mill could barely keep up with the ever-increasing demand. Charles Wesley Buss complained at one time, Buchanan's timber was so green that it was delivered in some instances with the leaves still growing on it. By cutting logs in the Harrop Reserve and booming them in from other locations on the lake, the mill continued to operate until 1892. After this time, new mills in Nelson and Pilot Bay started up. In the late 1880s, the company of Wilson and Purdue took on the adventuresome task of supplying beef to the mining camps. They drove the cattle down the Kettle Valley, swam them across the Columbia River above Castlegar, continued up the lower Kootenai River Trail, and pastured them on Evening Ridge, just southeast of Nelson. When Wilson and Purdue teamed up with Pat Burns in 1891, the area became known as Burns Meadows. Pat Burns Meadows, he used to have a cattle up there. Oh, you remember the yeah, right? Uh, during the war years, First World War, there was a cattle up there. Yeah. That, that was a hard hike. It was worse coming down and going up because sound was like that. Now, that's me and that's Sam Smith. He's gone now. Oh. That was his dog. Patsy. But you know those cabins, I don't know when they were built, because they were gone then in 20, they were, they were ruined, falling apart. I think they were prospectors, I never did find out, but they, that's the only thing I can put it down to is prospectors. Many of Harrop's earliest settlers were of Chinese descent. After helping to clear land and cut cordwood to fuel the paddle wheelers, they established thriving vegetable gardens in the clearings. Their fresh produce helped to meet the growing demand of local communities. The years from 1900 to the mid-1920s saw a major fruit boom in the West Arm area. It is difficult to believe that large orchards once lined the South Shore and that three steamers per day were filled on fruit runs. If you look closely, however, you can see rows of abandoned fruit trees throughout the area. The fruit industry here had its beginnings in the settlement plans of the Canadian government and the Canadian Pacific Railway. Anxious to encourage British and Prairie immigrants to settle and purchase railway lands in B.C., a massive propaganda campaign was launched around the turn of the century. Severe storms, thunder and lightning are unknown in the Kootenai. The thermometer rarely falls below zero. The fruit loads are so heavy the trees must be bolted up. Your market is at your door where the steamships dock. With ordinary intelligence, enterprise, and devotion, one must succeed. J.T. Bilby, a well-known fruit rancher on the South Shore, published his book, How to Build an Orchard in B.C., in 1912. The book was widely distributed and eagerly consumed by those interested in the fruit ranching business. Starting up a fruit ranch in the West Arm, however, was not nearly so straightforward as the early propaganda suggested. Some of the early settlers had purchased land site unseen. After taking one look at the steep and rugged terrain, many were discouraged. Some decided to stay and rise to the challenge. Huge stands of cedar had to be felled, stumps were blasted or pulled out by horses, and the slash was burned. To help cover expenses in the early years, berry crops and vegetables were planted. In beekeeping, dairy or poultry operations were set up. After planting fruit trees, it still took some six years before the trees produced marketable fruit. But produce fruit they did, and of internationally renowned quality. From packing sheds operating at Harrop and Sunshine Bay, fruit was shipped to markets on the prairies, on the west coast and overseas. The eventual decline of the West Arm fruit industry came in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Rising transportation costs, competition from the Okanagan and Washington, as well as a series of fruit blights damaged the industry to a point where it could not recover. The rugged hills of the West Arm have provided sustenance and recreation to trappers, hunters, fishermen and hikers who have traversed the area for decades. Trappers maintain the trails and build cabins along their trap lines. These cabins offered protection during the cold fall and winter months when the furs were the thickest. First one was a little wee cabin in that open place, just where you come up the trail and get out to the lake. It's kind of 
little bastard there. There's a camera over there. I slept in it once. And old John Arnold used to scrap that. Mm -hmm. Eventually he froze his foot and it turned into a gangrene and they had to take it foot off for all of me. And he, he had a, a pay leg and... Mm -hmm. Fishermen have sought out the high elevation lakes stocked with trout and fished the stream channels. Tom Proctor's old outlet hotel, deemed the Switzerland of North America, lured tourists and business people to fish, hunt, boat, bathe, and mountain climb. Recreational use of the area continues today. Paths trod by the Kootenai Indians, prospectors, miners, and trappers now carry hikers through the rugged wilderness and to sites of historical remains.